Good evening. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bard Graduate Center. My name is Ann Tartsinas. I'm the associate curator here at the Bard Graduate Center Gallery, and it's my pleasure to introduce our program tonight. Um, before I begin, I unfortunately have to ask you to turn off or silence your cell phones or devices. <laughs> um, and I'd like to say that this discussion is in conjunction with our exhibition, Fashioning the Body, an Intimate History of the Silhouette. Here we have the lovely catalog. And for those of you who haven't been to the gallery down the street to see the exhibition, I highly encourage you to attend. It's a spectacular display of men's wear and women's wear and children's wear that explores the understructures and foundation garments from the late 17th century to today. Um, and before I introduce our speakers, I would also like to invite you to return to this room uh, for two of our upcoming programs. On June 4th, we have Striking Poses, Bodies and Objects in 18th Century French Interiors, which will be a presentation by Mimi Hellman, who is the Department Chair and Associate Professor of Art History at Skidmore College. She will explore how interactions between people and their possessions most notably furniture, contributed to the definition of elite identities within elegantly decorated 18th century residencies. And then on June 11th, we have stuffed and stiffened, multi-layered garments, x-rays, revealed secrets, which features Jenny Tiramani, who is a Tony Award winning costume designer. And she will be speaking on her work reconstructing 17th and 18th century dress for the stage, but particularly through the use of X radiography. So also another exciting one on deck. But tonight, we are here for Fabricating the Dream, the Dandy's Silhouette. Um, in the exhibition, Fashioning the Body, as I mentioned down the street, we have one spectacular item that truly represents the archetype of the fashionable 19th century male. This is the jacket, or redding goat, of, of, from the French writer and legendary dandy, Jules Amadie Barbet d'Overy. But the history of menswear, and especially that of the dandy, um, particularly the varied mechanisms by which he sought to transform his figure, is extremely rich and certainly worth devoting an evening to. So, drawing upon their fantastic 2013 exhibition and the accompanying publication, Artists Rebel Dandy, Men of Fashion, which is published by Yale University Press. RISD Museum curators, Kate Irving and Lori Brewer, will discuss the extreme physical transformations employed by the dandy in the name of fashion. And to a little bit of an introduction, Kate Irvin is curator and head of the Department of Costume and Textiles at the Museum of Art, Rhode Island School of Design, the RISD Museum, where she has worked for the past 11 museum, or excuse me, 11 years, excuse me, <laughs> may feel, museum, museum, museum years, which can feel long. Um, her recent exhibitions and projects at the museum include the inaugural, inaugural displays in the mu museum's brand new Dongia Costume and Textiles Gallery, and Study Center in June 2014. From the Land of the Immortals, Chinese Taoist Robes and Textiles from 2012. Cocktail Culture, Ritual and Intervention in American Fashion, 1920 to 1980, and that was in 2011. That was curated with Joanne Ingersoll and Lori Brewer, our other speaker tonight. And Sartorial Sanctuary, Clothing and Tradition in the Islamic World from 2009. In addition to this extremely diverse list of exhibitions, Irvin spends much of the semester teaching object-based classes at RISD and also Brown that vary in subject matter from the history of Western dress to the history of Chinese art, from textile surface design to Native American literature. I am very excited to add that Kate is currently working on a Todd Oldham fashion exhibition, which will open at the RISD Museum in the spring of 2016, and also on a multidisciplinary exhibition entitled Repair, Thrift to Resistance, scheduled for the fall of 2018. And our other speaker, her partner in crime on this exhibition, Laurie Ann Brewer, is the associate curator in the Department of Costume and Textiles at the RISD Museum. 
Her recent exhibitions include Golden Glamour, the, e the, the excuse me, Golden Glamour, the Edith Steisevin Jerry Collection, and Indish Style, Batiks for the International Market. Previous exhibitions include Queen of the Insects, The Art of the Butterfly, and Asian Textiles and the Grammar of Ornament, Design in the Victorian Age. Prior to her post at the RISD Museum, Lori worked in the Department of Textiles at the museum at, at FIT. And her research often explores the intersections of nature and art, focusing on the ecology of fashion from the 19th century to the present day. Her upcoming exhibition will trace the history and politics of the neutral tints in apparel and design and is titled Nude, Fashion's Most Shocking Color, <laughs> opening in spring 2019. Please join me in welcoming our curators to the podium. Good evening. Can everyone hear us all right? Is the mic working? And wonderful. We would first like to extend thanks to Anne and Melissa and the Bard Graduate Center for the invitation to present. It is our pleasure to join you this evening and to participate in the programming surrounding Fashioning the Body and Intimate History of the Silhouette. Kate and I were eager to continue our investigation of the Dandy after our 2013 exhibition at the RISD Museum, and we were certainly intrigued by Anne's invitation to further exam examine the Dandy Silhouette. This evening, Kate and I will form a chorus and offer you two additional methods of investigating the body of the dandy. The material by way of the fabric and tailoring that envelops the dandy physique and the imaginative and artistic shaping of the dandy persona. It is our hope that this journey will augment the items on display in fashioning the body which includes some rather extreme forms of a masculine body modification, much like the calf improvers and some of the male corsetry, with a perspective on the additional methods the dandy undertook in altering his body image. In an article titled, A Toff for All Seasons, a typically witty entry in the GQ column Merkin on Style, which ran from 1988 to 1991, RISD alum and painting professor and self-described flaneur Richard Merkin describes an episode in Providence when a student walked by, quote, wearing an ancient black top coat that brought me to a state of attention bordering on the catatonic. It was well-worn, but not threadbare, and the sheer elegance of its formal lines and details suggested, even at a quick glance, the skills of a master British craftsman." End quote. Merkin flagged the boy down, looked into the breast pocket of a coat, a thrift sale find, and found confirmation not only that the coat was tailored by the illustrious Savile Row tailoring firm E. Touts, but also that it was made for his sartorial idol, J. Drexel Biddle, Jr. of Philadelphia. Merkin arranged with the student to borrow the relic so that he could have it copied by his own tailor, Bernard Wetherill. But in the end, though beautifully made, Merkin was disappointed, finding the coat just not the same as Biddle's. In Merkin's words, quote, the whole affair did teach me a lesson about clothing and life, which is simply that even the most adroit of artisans cannot fabricate a dream." End quote. To Merkin's point, and as Laurie has outlined in her introduction, tonight we will highlight the tailor's art as providing the foundation for the dandy's distinctive silhouette while conceding that in the end, the dandy's image is a collective creation constructed by the public, the critic, and of course, the dandy himself. The dandy and his commentators have in essence worked in concert with the tailor to fabricate a dream image wherein exaggeration, humor, and differentiation play a role in molding the substance of his form. Far from pure abstractions, 
These dreams, much like graphic caricatures, are founded in reality and physicality and are made visible in and on the bodies of the dandies themselves. If there is a purpose for the dandies' bespoke pursuits, it might just be to slow time, to appreciate the attention that is required in crafting the bespoke suit, to admire its finer points, to see it as a part of living history. Craftsmanship, artistry, and materials are of the utmost importance, all working in concert to transform the silhouette of the dandy. The dandy's acute attention to detail often begins with a materials investigation, extends to his choice of tailor, and culminates with the art of accessorizing the ensemble. This artistry continues as these elements are arranged on the body and correctly cared for to maintain their beauty and perfection. It is with this knowledge and these rituals that a well-dressed man transforms himself into the figure of the dandy. Yet above all, it is the quality of the fabric that ultimately makes a work of bespoke suiting sublime. If the fabric does not match the lifestyle or intended use of the suit, all the hours spent on its creation will be in vain, as the fabric will give way under use. George, Bry George Bryan Beau Brummel, who we know as Beau Brummel now, understood this. Indeed, his dandyism depended upon the sophisticated understanding of how fabric impacted the ultimate design, appearance, and life of his wardrobe. Max Bierbaum, the Brummel authority of the 20th century, artist, writer, and dandy himself, once observed, quote, in certain congruities of dark cloth, in the rigid perfection of his linen, lay the secret of Mr. Brummel's miracles, end quote. And here we see some of that linen and broadcloth that those works and miracles would have been transformed onto Brummel's body in. The figure of the dandy has evolved into diverse expressions over the course of two centuries, but always tracks back to the extremely neat buttoned up figure of Beau Brummel on the upper left here, if you don't recognize the gentleman. Born outside the aristocracy, Brummel forged a path to the heart of exclusive London society by deploying the emergent craft of tailoring, whose practitioners helped to sculpt Brummel's dashing and artful figure of wit and authority. Sadly, however, no garments are known to have survived from the wardrobe of this dandy forebearer. Brummel spent his formative years from 1786 to 1793 at the prestigious prep school Eton College. For many young men, this academic world offered the first opportunity to exert personal choice within their wardrobe, within the regulations of the Eton standard. While Brummel was introduced to bespoke at Eton, his tastes were refined when he joined the Light Dragoons or the 10th Royal Hussars in 1794. The requisite uniform for the Prince of Wales' own military regiment was a costly uniform to be paid for by the soldier himself. Such was the personal burden for the honor and prestige of serving in such an elite military corps. <laughs> It was Brummel's exposure to the sartorial uniforms at Eton and the Hussars that would greatly influence his theories of dress to come. All that precision and attention to detail is coming from these two very regulated um, points in his background. And these experiences also introduced him to one of his most favorite tailoring firms, Schweitzer and Davidson. And here we see, um, just by way of explaining a bit more of the prints that you're seeing, of course, Brummel on the left, a dandy of 1919 from the John Johnson collection at Oxford, and on the far right, a print um, with watercolor in the RISD Museum collection that is from the pump rooms in Bath, where Brummel also spent quite a bit of time. In the early 19th century, broadcloth, a felted wool fabric, was not only luxurious, not only strong, but unprecedented in its ability to conform to the wearer's body. The slim-fitting, double-breasted greatcoat here at the top is a rare surviving garment from the period of Beau Brummel's fashion supremacy. 
Our understanding of Brummel today is based solely on artistic and written depictions, most of which were created after his death. This coat, tailored by London's famed John Weston of Old Bond Street, gives material evidence of the wardrobe of the bow. And in many ways, um, for the 2013 exhibition, I think this object carried the same emotional resonance for the visitors that the Barbet Redding Goat carries for visitors here to the Bard exhibition. This coat was discovered at Coots Bank in London, where the tailor had deposited it for an unknown client in 1956, yet it had remained from creation until 1956 in the hands of the tailoring firm. A letter accompanying the coat described it as, quote, an exceedingly good blue cloth gray coat made in every respect in the best manner, end quote. The dark blue silk velvet collar the M notch on the collar, the long sleeves and self cuffs. The coat is unlined apart from the sleeves, which are lined in silk twill, and it has two back pockets made from coarse wool. Since it was deposited in the vaults of Coots & Co. in London, this garment has survived in absolute pristine condition. There are no moth holes. There is no abrasion of the pile of the broadcloth. It's absolutely perfect. And it illustrates the understated sophistication of garments worn by Brummel in his circle. And across the bottom, you can see images from the artist Dighton showing just those gentlemen from Brummel's circle at the time and to see how the figure of the dandy, how the drape of the broadcloth was moving across their body. Robert Dighton's 1805 full-length watercolor portrait, now in a private collection in Turkey, is the singular extant image of the young Beau Brummel. And it was made during the height of Brummel's social and sartorial prominence within the aristocratic circles of early 19th century Regency England. From the curls of his hair to the meticulously polished Hessian boots, this rendering captures the exacting natures of Brummel's appearance, a harmonious and exceedingly correct style of dressing that would define him as the archetypal dandy. His perfectly tailored woolen broadcloth coat, form-fitting trousers, and faultless cravat complete the look and have provided subsequent generations of admirers with an ideal of elegance and restraint. Brummel's first biographer, William Jesse, writing in 1844, was careful to distance his subject from the prevailing understanding of the dandy in his day, as a comic figure, that is, of mindless sartorial extravagances who came too close to the world of feminine fripperies. He wrote, quote, if, as I apprehend, glaring extravaganzas in dress constitute dandyism, Brummel was most assuredly no dandy." End quote. The recent film, Beau Brummel, This Charming Life, based on Ian Kelly's more recent 2005 biography, takes many cues from Jesse's portrayal. And I'm just going to show you a quick clip. Gentlemen, observe. Here we see your boringly commonplace fop. Well, as far as I can see, George, he ain't much to look at. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like a peacock. Vanity, his weakness for all the world to see. But the dandy stands feet square, one foot slight in advance of the other. Bent at the knees, but not too much. Back, lengthening, broadening. Head up, chin out. Look straight ahead and forward. <laughs> Gentlemen, I give you the dandy. And so, as we just saw, within the dandy circle, it was indeed the malleability and taut drape that conformed to the neoclassical taste in revealing the natural form, a taste that Brummel's youthful physique was especially matched for. Although his image is often associated with beautification and softening of the male image, 
Brummel's point of departure for dandyism comes from an overtly masculine pace. Remember his time at Eton, his time with the Royal Hussars. Literary historian Ellen Morris observes, quote, by making simplicity the fashion, Brummel established a style suitable for any man, king, or commoner who aspired after the distinction of gentlemen. With, without sacrificing elegance or grace, he invented costume that was indubitably masculine, end quote. The fashionable understatement and unfettered democratic appearance of broadcloth supported the intellectual and political leanings of Brummel and his followers. In short, the performative function of a bespoke suit for Brummel was to drive him ever more forward towards a masculine modernity, an end use that was entirely dependent on his introduction to the cloth. And you can tell I'm a textile historian, right? <laughs> Ian Kelly notes, quote, so precisely could new tailors mold the fabric, the broadcloth to the body, while subtly flattering or improving where necessary, that Lord Byron was moved to remark of a Schweitzer coat on Brummel that you, quote, might almost say what the body thought, end quote. Brummel's sartorial power is recorded in the following quote from William Jesse, and we're looking at an image of three broadcloth coats from the RISD Museum collections from the 1830s. And here is um, Jesse's quote. His tailors were Schweitzer and Davidson in Cork Street, and a certain German named Meyer on Conduit Street. These tailors also served the prince. One day, a man from the provinces came in to ask Davidson to dress him fashionably. Why, sir, replied the artist, the prince wears superfine, and Mr. Brummel, the bath coating. These are both textile types. But it's immaterial which you choose, Sir John. Suppose, sir, we say the bath coating. I think Mr. Brummel has a trifle the preference, end quote. And with these very coats that are of American production, we actually see the continuation of attention here stateside for this quality of fabric. On each one of these coats, you can see gilt brass buttons, which I can, hopefully you can see the glint in this photograph, stamped upon each one of these buttons that the textile manufacturers had in their stock is information about the quality of broadcloth that has been used to construct the garment. And so starting from the left, we have a coat circa 1830 worn by Edward Carrington in Providence, Rhode Island. And the button is stamped R W Robinson, extra rich. The next piece, circa 1835, worn by N.W. Chapin, is one stamped Robinson Jones and Co., extra fine rich, so even fancier broadcloth. And the farthest is um, worn by a member of the Giles Lodge family, also in Rhode Island, circa 1840. And this one is stamped D. Evans & Co., Attleboro, Mass., super fine, end quote. At the height of his social prominence, Brummel negotiated a place for himself within the aristocratic establishment and spawned a dandy club of friends, cohorts, and followers, including the Prince Regent. In the 1810s, caricaturist Richard Dighton humorously portrayed members of this so-called dandiacal body in separate full-figure studies, much in the same way that his father had depicted Beau Brummel some 10 years earlier, um, which we saw in the full-length watercolor that, um, that we just had on the screen. Here we see the mirror of fashion. This version is from the collections of um, the Yale Center for British Art, um, but, uh, or I'm sorry, this one's from the Victorian Albert Museum of Childhood. It's for some reason classified as a toy. Um, but uh, but if you if, if you're, would like to see a, one that's in a closer um, collection, then uh, you can go to the Yale Center for British Art. It's a panoramic compilation made in 1823 of 53 dandies of the day. The impressive scroll provides a unique opportunity to observe these figures in relation to one another, offering a sweeping overview of the range of clothes-wearing personalities that studded the London cityscape at this time. 
As this view clearly shows, most of these fashionable men were not wearing extreme body-modifying garments. Their clothing is tailored of fine materials and distinguishing but not shocking. Made in 1818, again by Richard Dighton, two years after Brummel's exile to France to escape gambling debts, this print reveals a very different perspective on the fashionable dandy set. It satirizes the excesses of gentlemen enjoying themselves at private clubs such as the renowned Almax or Whites, from wasp-waisted, full-chested silhouettes with terribly high collars and elaborate cravats to wanton drinking and gambling. Already, we see illustrated the quick downfall of the dandy as he is portrayed in popular prints. Members of the dandy club would also become the model for less well-equipped sartorial imitators, and as a result, far more biting satire. Here in an installation image from the 2013 exhibition at RISD, we see that image of Brummel really brought to life um, with garments and really serving the role as um, bringing texture and hand to that beautiful Dighton illustration. From the sumptuous linen shirt to the supple, deep blue broadcloth coat, and expertly contoured pantaloons and really look at that silhouette um, against the glass, in particular the calf, we see the far reach of Brummel's um, sartorial influence. As suggested by these pieces, Brummel's preference in fabric and cut signaled the shift from the embellished and overtly sumptuous ensembles to suits that celebrated the body through painstaking tailoring. So they weren't satins and spangles, it was all about cut and line. The pantaloons sharply delineated. With this new Bromelian standard of masculine elegance came a new language of textiles, as English woolen broadcloths surpassed French silks in the popular taste for male wardrobes. Balzac would describe the year 1789 as the year of the debate between silk and broadcloth. And this being the year of the French Revolution, his words aptly describe the political association of each fabric, as well as the sartorial revolution that would ensue as menswear came to adopt a new Brummelian aesthetic. Lacking in the overt ostentation of French silks, broadcloth became a new signifier of luxury. The luxury of broadcloth results from the sheer amount of high quality wool fiber textile comprises what's known as a full breadth, approximately 60 inches wide, hence its name. After weaving, the yardage is washed and subjected to a felting process that produces a very dense fabric as the textile shrinks. After felting, a finisher raises the nap, the surface of the textile, into lamb's ear softness. Light, as you can see in this image, plays against the sublime surface and produces an incredible depth of color. And here's one image that we briefly touched upon before, also from the RISD Museum collection. And it's really capturing, again, that haunting depth of color and softness of the fabric and the beautiful drape that's achievable with this textile. Economist John Moreau has observed that it was, quote, virtually indestructible and could be worn by and through several generations, end quote. But how did broadcloth, a fabric after all, support the sartorial self-creation of the original dandy? Indeed, it was all about the cloth. Woolen broadcloth was not only luxurious, not only strong, but unprecedented in its ability to conform to the wearer's body. These were the lycra spandex textile fibers of the period. <laughs> Historian Michael Zakin, who has exhaustively traced the evolution of the craft of tailoring in the 19th century, speaks to the physical attributes of the cloth, calling it, quote, highly malleable, easily molded, stretched, shrunk, and shaped to fit the body in a way that silk, for instance, never could, end quote. 
And so here we see that is also on exhibition in the center of the screen, the calf improver that was worn at this time. This is worn by the gentleman that did not have that youthful Adonis-like physique of Beau Brummel and that needed a little extra to plump out the beautiful calf of their trousers. Um, this one, the image, it's turned inside out so that you can see all of the woolen batting that would be towards the inside of the body when worn. And on the far right, we see two images of what's happening inside the tailoring firms. However, both of these have a tint of the satirical to them, where you can see that the tailor in particular at the top is doing not quite a good job um, on tailoring the um, long great coat to the wearer. Broadcloth was extremely appealing to British tailors. Um, cutting and tailoring broadcloth as opposed to silk is a very different undertaking, requiring an exactitude that only the tailors of Savile Row possessed. Further, the inherent strength of this material allowed such fabric to be left with raw edges, free of bulky hems and unlined, and that was just the case with the Great Bank. The advent of the tape measure, which by 1816 to 1820 was in common use at most firms, to the same type of satirical barbs as their clients were. During the 1830s and 1840s, a time driven by the influence of industry, tailors needed increased efficiency. New systems and methodologies were introduced, and tailoring was become more commercialized. And due to this, some feared that the art of the craft was fading away. Tailors did, however, continue to educate clients, sharing information about the history, science, economics, um, and use of different textiles. I will now offer you two quotes from tailoring journals um, of the period, the first from a trade publication and the second from the popular press, just so we can hear the tone of discussion about the tailor. First from a periodical called The Tailor's Friendly Instructor, being an easy guide to obtain the principle and leading points essential to the art of fitting the human shape from 1830. And that you can find at the Yale Center for British Art, the Rare Books and Manuscripts Collection. Quote, to those who have had some little experience in the art and are occasionally in the habit of cutting, but do not exactly consider themselves entitled to the honorable distinction of practical cutters, I will hesitate not to say, find the following pages capable of imparting much instruction and material assisting them towards the attainment of so desirable an object, as the work is the result of close application, tireless study, and perseverance and I trust shall not be accused of vanity or presumption when I add of long and extensive practice in the art." End quote. Now the second quote for comparison is from the town of 1838, which is illustrated here. And this comes from the Henry Poole archives, which um, is one of the greatest firms um, and oldest firms on Savile Row. Quote, of all the handicrafts, that of tailoring appears to be the most successful in the modern arts. In the way of making, coining money, we might compare it to witchcraft. The march of refinement has made rapid strides to this particular walk of scientific improvement. There are now no longer a tailor to be found in the classic region of St. James's. No, they are one and all professors of the art of cutting. The two quotes then from the 1830s, um, we see here the arguments as set forth by Brummel at the turn of the 19th century as to the art of dress have begun to enter the realm of scientific dress. The practitioner of the art of dress is pitted against his satirical, satirical critic. In the first quote from Wyatt, the standardization of the tailoring practice is espoused. Implicit in this passage and the following is the popular conception of the tailor as an untrustworthy character, a long-standing conceit in literature and caricature of the 18th and 19th centuries. In his attempt to stress his product as art, Riot belays his own insecurities with that very role. 
In the critique of the tailor from the London Society Journal, The Town, it is clear that the public perception of the tailors, um, such as Wyatt, who fancy themselves artists, is met with jest and great suspicion. Further, in his defense, Wyatt and his tailors um, are quite justified in seeking standardized methods of cutting to protect themselves from dissatisfied customers and to defray some of the high costs of running their shops. It was the textiles that were the greatest investment during this time. Inclusive of such woes, though, as customers who were negligent in paying for their garments. And you remember Kate referring to Bo having to um, flee from England. It's due to the debts that he racked up at his tailors and gambling debts on top of that. But many of the clients were not paying their tailors. However, the root of the argument is another layer of discussion. While well, Wyatt appropriated the language of artistic tailoring in his decidedly more commercialized practice, the town justly exposed the practitioners as those partaking in witchcraft. A certain club of tailors could justly define themselves as artists, those that resided on the row. In 1851, the Gazette of Fashion and Cutting Room Companion, here illustrated, stressed the importance of professionalization and professional research for tailors. The 19th century set a course away from the bespoke ideals of Brummel and toward ready-to-wear standardization, offering the young dandy little opportunity to explore the art of dress as Brummel had. As the industry increasingly commercialized, however, a few avenues did remain for the tailor and the client to continue to educate themselves about the high quality materials that would have been familiar to Brummel and his circle. Tailors would often hold lengthy discussions on the history, science, economics, and potential use of different fibers and textile, textile types with their clients. The Gazette of Fashion and Cutting Room Companion stressed the importance of both fibers and professional research. Um, at the Crystal Palace exhibition of 1851, there were displays of, quote, clothing for immediate personal or domestic use, end quote. And even more interesting, there were displays of animal and vegetable substances chiefly used in the manufacture as implements or for ornaments. And that was under the category of textile fabrics and clothing providing richly dem demonstrative venues for tradesmen to present their professional practice and product to clients. In this beautiful il illustration from the printmaker and tailor, so he has this exciting combination of being both an illustrator of fashion but also a practitioner of making the garments, um, we see what is the scene and fashions for 1839 and 1840. And Benjamin Reed created an entire series of these prints. And I'm just going to scroll through some details as I talk about this richly colored print. Unique in his field, Benjamin Reed was, as I just mentioned, a tailor and printmaker. This work depicts a group of fashionable men and women visiting Madame Trousseau's waxwork installation in honor of Queen Victoria's 1838 coronation. Each figure in the foreground is outfitted in an ensemble designed by and procurable from Reed. It is clear from the manner in which the tailors of this period, like Reed and his contemporaries, approached their work that they held little question themselves as to the art of their profession. This next image, we see yet another trade publication from the period that tailors were using within the actual then shop when clients would come to choose their ensemble. And in this beautifully hand-colored triple fold-out at the top, we see that in this publication, the Gentleman's Monthly Magazine of Fashion, there were also pattern, line patterns, that were used in this part. And here we see that you're really looking at the standardization as well as the beauty of this craftsmanship during this time. The writer Thomas Carlyle is often identified as the literary source of Victorian aversion to and mistrust of dandies. 
In his tome of satirical fiction, Sartor Resartus, or The Tailor Retailored, published in 1834, the chapter titled The Dandiacal Body opens with this statement, quote, a dandy is a clothes-wearing man, a man whose trade, office, and existence consists in the wearing of clothes. Every faculty of his soul, spirit, purse, and person is heroically consecrated to this one object, the wearing of clothes wisely and well, so that as others dress to live, he lives to dress." End quote. While Carlyle relied on exaggeration to convey a moral message, this caricature persists in definitions of the dandy today, even in many dictionary um, definitions of the term. Sartre Rosartus was originally printed in installments in Fraser's magazine for Town and Country, a magazine launched in 1830 in response to, the, to the, what the editors saw as the frivolities of aristocratic exclusiveness. Each issue included a gallery of literary characters, one example of which can be seen here. So pictured here is Count d'Orsay, dubbed by Thomas Carlyle as to be the emperor of European dandies. The accompanying biography was mildly mocking, and the sketch shows d'Orsay resplendent in a pose that directly inspired illustrator Ray Irvin in 1925 to create Eustace Tilly the caricature of a butterfly dandy who was featured on the cover of the first issue of The New Yorker and on many anniversary issues to this day. We are thus regularly still reminded of the extremes of the flamboyant butterfly dandy bedecked with monocle, high-starched collar, and top hat, as opposed to the restraint of Beau Brummel. This humorous booklet, titled The Fiddle Faddle Fashion Book in Beaumont a la Française, enriched with numerous highly colored figures of ladylike gentlemen, was published in 1840 and is quite clear in its portrayal of dandies as vainglorious ladylike gentlemen with elaborate coiffures and hourglass silhouettes. Though printmaker John Leach and many others would continue to ridicule the excesses of fashion in English publications such as Punch, it is at this point that the tide starts to turn in, in favor of the dandy's image. Already depicted by Leach as less grotesque than the Cruikshanks dandies, the maligned clothes-wearing man of the 1820s and 1830s would soon transform into an artistic and empowered artist rebel dandy with the help of French writers Jules Barbet de Orvilly, Honoré, Honoré de Balzac, and Charles Baudelaire. At the same time that the alleged extremes of the clothes-wearing man were the subject of taunting and satire in England, in France, a deferential discussion of the dandy image and lineage emerged in the writings of Bar Balzac, Barbet de Orvilly, and Baudelaire. In particular, these writers each present the figure of the dandy as the embodiment of, of the unity of life, art, and elegance, but also as a figurehead for rebellion. In The Anatomy of Dandyism, published in 1845, Dorvilly places Brummel's character and appearance at the crux of his argument. Barbie's aim was not simply to document Brummel's elegance, but rather to connect his talent to that of art and intellect. Quote, he rose, speaking of Brummel, he rose to the rank of an idea. He was dandyism itself, end quote in their own ways and to varying degrees of success, as you can see here, Balzac, Barbet, and Baudelaire attempted for a time to fulfill their theoretical dream of the dandy in their own person, utilizing the dandy's intrinsic distinctiveness to make their mark on the Parisian boulevard and in society. And so, as promised, akin to the gray coat, here is the wonderfully exquisite um, garment that we have on view down the street in the exhibition from um, Barbet. But what really excited me as we were working on this exhibition and I was looking for images of Barbet was to come across this beautiful photograph of him wearing what is nearly identical, if not the same, garment. Um, and what is particularly exquisite about this image is you can see 
the way that he stands, the way that he holds himself, and look at that waistline, and look at that silhouette. Um, so wonderful kudos to the installation staff of the exhibition who so very carefully looked to the silhouette of the garment and didn't in the least bit over pad or move away or over enhance. It's really there um, in terms of the line of silhouette. And when you compare, then um, burn into your mind this image of um, Barbet's garment, and then look at this fashion illustration. And if you look at the gentleman third from the left, you can see that exact same type of silhouette. I'll just flip back for a moment. And then to this piece here, we can see how the cut and line of menswear is changing. What is different about this image is the polychrome tints that we are seeing in the men's garments. Um, this wonderful varied palette that is coming into play, um, something that we haven't seen since the courtly fashions because Brummel, of course, espoused that very austere palette in his wardrobe and for the dandies. Um, the period is often understood as the great masculine renunciation as codified by the psychologist J.C. Flugel, who in his 1932 text, The Psychology of Clothes, really set down this theory. Modern scholarship and research has revealed that while men, many men were lost in a sea of black suits, even if they were impeccably be tailored, there were others, like those idealized in this fashion plate, who continued to relish the personal choice and liberty of dress in their choice of styling, texture, and color. Further, Eldolf Luz wrote in Why Man Should Be Well-Dressed, Appearances Can Be Revealing, quote, it is true that there are cheap and expensive clothes. This depends on the materials used, as well as the quality of workmanship. However, this too has its limits. In sports, we have champions who run the 100 yards in the absolute fastest time. There is one person who jumps higher than all the others. Therefore, there is one excellent tailor who uses the best materials to technically make the best possible clothes. He could be in New York, in London, or in Paris. I don't know where he is. Luxury is a very necessary thing. Someone must pay for quality labor. And the luxury industry, which serves only a very few, and basically represents the same concept as that mentioned in earlier regard to the best sprinter and best jumper, means that at least a small group of manually skilled people must be able to produce this perfection in painstaking labor through talent and persistence." End quote. And I'll flip through just a few details because you may not have seen. Look at the beauty of that blue trouser, the check, the nap in what can only be described, or um, Kate and I, we've been looking for a trouser like this, but mohair was an incredibly popular fiber during this time. And I can only imagine that this had this beautiful brushed um, surface and sheen and length of fiber within that plaid format. There's one pair of trousers um, at Platt Hall in Manchester in England that comes close to approximating this. And we see here, again, the beauty of the silhouette. And back to Kate. In the latter decades of the 19th century in England, in their self-presentation, artists James McNeil Whistler at right and Oscar Wilde at left also pushed for a return to the dandyism of the Regency as theorized by Baudelaire. In other words, to stand out and provoke. Theirs was a performative dandyism, a prototype of camp in performance critic Rhonda Kerelik's view, and it formed a vital part of their celebrity. In the case of Wilde, especially when he adopted the aesthetic knee breeches, velvet jacket, and floppy tie for his American lecture tour, it is what Stephen Calloway has called a, quote, dandyism of the senses, a self-consciously precious and highly fastidious discrimination brought to bear on both art and life, end quote. Historian Jonathan Sherland has argued that Whistler adapted his characteristic sartorial style, the dark suit, monocle, stiff collar, and walking stick, in reference to the stereotype of the dude, which was a middle-class vulgarization of the gentlemanly ideal. Quote, he walked a precarious path 
between deferring to secure models of male attire and parodically inverting them through exaggeration, end quote. Both Wilde and Whistler have come to be seen as paradigms of an excessive form of fin de siècle dandyism, and in their appearance, they fed off of one another as much as they looked to Regency and French interpretations of the artist dandy's role in society. Though the velvet breeches are most often associated with Wilde, his later style projects the quiet refinement of the gentleman, wearing evening attire on the left and morning suit in the photo at right. This style approximated Whistler's tailored image, which tweaked the gentlemanly norm, suggesting that Wilde also meant to employ an exaggerated self-presentation, embodied character, caricature, if you will, to enact social commentary and rebellion. Writer and caricaturist Max Beerbaum also embodied multiple dreams, evoking past states of English dandyism while crossing the threshold into the 20th century. In his 1896 essay, Dandies and Dandies, Beerbaum circles back to Brummel so that he may wrestle the image of the dandy from the likes of the Count d'Orsay, those flamboyant types of the 1820s and 1830s with their countless rings and extravagant vulgarity, as well as his contemporaries who had succumbed to the bohemian or aesthetic ideal. In Beerbaum's vision, Brummel was, quote, ever most economical, most scrupulous of means, end quote, and as such, in the utmost sense of the word, an artist. Beerbaum protested the effeminacy of Whistler and Wilde, but did so with humor. At left, this portrayal of his brother, stage actor Herbert Beerbaum Tree, is one of a number of caricatures poking fun at the at sinuous curves of the dandy's tailored body. And while Beerbaum considered himself a, quote, dapper, small, neat little man in black, end quote, he did not escape his own waggish parody. In the center image, he applies to his own silhouette the same touches that we see in the sketch of his brother. Walter Sickert's caricature of Beerbaum at the far right illustrates his perfect decorum and projects a humorous message similar to that outlined in Dighton's portrayal of Brummel. On paper, Beerbaum's humor captured the aesthetic excesses of some of his fellow artist dandies, as well as those that he performed himself, while in his person, he buttoned himself up into the polished armor of a dapper, small, neat little man in black. And much like the morning suit worn by Oscar Wilde, here we see a collection item from the RISD Museum that was created actually in 1941, um, attesting to just the timelessness of this garment. This piece was created by the Savile Row firm of Norton and & Sons, and it was created for another Rhode Island resident, Eben S. Doolittle. Um, and this piece is really evocative for me of this idea of the continuing trend in terms of the material choices that we've been talking so much about, the broadcloth, which by this point in time has nearly died out from usage on Savile Row, and moving into now what has become the new standardization in terms of a male wardrobe. If there was one bespoke item that a man in this period had, it was a morning suit. In this next image, we see the, one of the most challenging textile types of the modern period, um, the modern period meaning the, the, the 20th century, um, moving us away again from broadcloth, and that is the Glen Urca check, um, most commonly referred to as Glen Plaid. Extra fabric is needed, um, not because of the shrinking or contraction that we see in the fulling process of broadcloth, but because of the alignment of the plaid. And so it costs additional money just for the materials themselves to be able to cut the suit. And on the right, you can see an example in the Glen plaid fabric in that pattern from the RISD Museum collections. This three-piece suit um, was tailored for a RISD apparel professor, Bertrand Supernaut, by the firm of Kilgore French and Stanbury. The Supernaut suit represents a special feat of patterning, um, tailoring. He commissioned this suit in 1959, the same year as another gray Kilgore suit. Does anyone know? 
1959. It was the one worn by Cary Grant in North by Northwest, and it became a legendary example of tailoring and style. Both suits were made from the lightweight worsted wool in Glen Plaid and feature the same elegance of line, although Supernauts was commissioned before the film. And um, so even before the film was released, Supernaut had his up in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and the same look became coveted by men the world over. Here are just a few details of the beauty and understatement of the construction from the fine needlework under the collar to the fit of the trousers to the working buttonhole on the turned back cuff. In both the film version and the RISD version, the same elegance of line, um, one can really imagine Supernaut dashing across the Providence campus with the most rakish air. Richard Merkin, who Kate has spoken about, his fellow RISD painting professor, um, relayed the illustrator Russell O. Jones' adoration of Grant's Kilgore suit in Merkin's own G um, GQ article, quote, a few salacious words about Maryland's panties and other coveted togs from Tinselland. That's the quote of the, or title of the article, rather. And here's the quote. My ideal item of Hollywood clothing would have to be the suit worn by Cary Grant when he was attacked by the crop duster. As far as I could tell, the suit was ruined. Imagine the effect DDT has on wool, to say nothing of all the topsoil. But never fear, a quick sponging off and a pressing by the hotel valet, and presto, Mr. Grant looked even better than he did before. I'd like to own that indestructible suit. It would allow me to look as debonair as Cary Grant. So the dandy lineage continues. Indeed, from the moment Grant appeared on screen, men have been coveting this feat of tailoring. While the debate has often followed this suit um, as to who can actually claim the rights to its design, different firms on Savile Row each want to claim um, ownership of creation of the suit because the Hollywood studios worked with several firms in development of the film, it is indeed a Kilgore example through and through. Um, there is a wonderful quote also from Tom Wolfe about the construction of this very suit, the suit rather worn by Cary Grant in the film. And he writes, real buttonholes, that's it. A man can take his thumb and forefinger and unbutton his sleeve at the wrist. Once you know about it, you start seeing them everywhere, all the time. There are just two classes of men in this world, men with suits whose buttons are just sewn onto the sleeve in some kind of hideous, cheapy decoration, or yes, men who can unbutton the sleeve at the wrist because they have real buttonholes and the sleeves really buttoning up. Fascinating, end quote. Now, when we were working on the exhibition, I came to find um, Luciana Barbera here illustrated, um, became my contemporary style icon for the exhibition. Um, He's the textile and fashion mogul who has been surrounded by fine materials and sophisticated um, designs his entire life. He's the son of Carlo Barbera, the founder of Carlo Barbera um, Textile Mill. And he grew up surrounded by woolens and eventually pursued an apprenticeship in the textile mills of Leeds and Stratfordshire in England. Barbera is thoroughly modern in his approach to dandyism, maintaining a handcrafted tradition within his own tailoring workshops. He appears regularly on um, the well-known Sartorialist um, blog, as well as his own blog. Of his own appearance, he writes, quote, I would like to add that I would never refer to myself as stylish. And remember, that's just like Brummel talking about not bringing attention to yourself. And he continues, but my children wanted me to write it, so I did. What I would have said is I simply had the right clothes on for the right occasions, and I didn't leave them crumpled in a ball at the foot of my bed. If that's style, all right, I own to it, end quote. Um, on the very left, we see the image of him in 1968 wearing the suit. So this is Barbera wearing the suit. And for the exhibition, we were able to lend the actual suit from his personal archives. And that's an image of him um, in the present day. Um, it's 
The suit itself was Luciano's first textile design for the Barbera mill from upon his return to Italy, and it showcases what the Barbera line is still lauded for today, the expert union of, um, of Italian refinement and smart British sportiness. And Luciano, he considers the relationship um, to the product quite deeply within the company, and he describes the process by which raw fiber is transformed into yardage at the mill as, quote, the noblization of the fabric, end quote. And I love how much he sounds like the different exhibitions um, and the um, different displays at the Crystal Palace, the true obsession for the fiber. Um, and even within the mill labor, he has remarked, ah, it is hard work for poets about his workers. Um, as did Brummel. Barbera continues the tradition of reverence for cloth, and he really is carrying on the torch of the dandy silhouette and style based in materiality. So we're concluding um, by coming full circle back to our dandy hero, Richard Merkin. <clears throat> A dedicated dandy from the late 1960s through the 1990s, Merkin continued the tradition of conscientious self-representation. Quoting him, he, he says, I've given quite a lot of thought to this, how one materially chooses to enact his life. He hung Walter Sickert's caricature of Beerbaum in his bedroom between his two clothes closets as a reminder of Beerbaum's philosophy, style, and humor. In an article paying homage to one of his New York tailors, Merkin wrote, quote, what he did was make me a wonderful suit, one that expressed the very contradictions that I have harbored in the labyrinths of my psyche. I cannot imagine a bolt of cloth being treated with greater empathy, nor, for that matter, whimsy, end quote. Merkin suits were individually patterned and crafted to express his personal vision and originality. Merkin's friend Tom Wolfe praised this quality, saying, quote, even the smallest detail becomes a discrete element of design, a Turkish cigarette, a glove, Panamas, and boutonnieres. As Wolf's prose portrait shows, the dandy's self-definition is rooted in the smallest details of materiality, craftsmanship, and self-expression. The dandy story began with a fixation on clothing mixed with a form of fiction, or at least exaggeration and self-invention. The myth and stylized image of the dandy was born of the conventions of caricature, both visual and literary, and the clothes-wearing man in his material life utilized the intensity, magnification, and emphasis inherent in the genre of caricature to express himself and his art. The dream state sets in as the artist dandy, a living, breathing caricature, pointedly pushes the boundaries between reality and illusion to the point of collapsing, redefining his sartorial self over and over and enacting change via his dress. As our painter dandy hero Richard Merkin describes his own approach to outfitting himself, there are boundaries and there are rules to be sure, but for the dandy they are elastic and ripe for embellishment or even rupture. In his own words, quote, dressing like painting should have residual stability plus punctuation and surprise. Somewhere, like in Crazy Cat, you've got to throw the brick. Thank you. Questions. Um, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, I'll start off with a question that, um, before we open the floor, that kind of ties it back to the exhibition down the street, which is in the earlier period, in the caricatures, there were examples of the men wearing stays, wearing the corsets. And we unfortunately do not have a, a corset or a stays for, for men's wear for men to wear, excuse me, down the street. But I'm wondering, there's there's a few excellent examples. There's a couple illustrated in the Fashion and Body catalog, but were those also made by the tailors? Or do we do we know who was making those for the men, or was it the same, or same creators who made them for women? Um, 
It is. That's a great question. There actually, I have come across. And can everyone hear me? That the mic or okay. let me know if you can't hear me. But um, it is. There has been reference made to that tailors were making them, and I don't know if that's a bit of the um, prudishness in terms of again that gender stratification that of course you know men could never go to the stays maker. Um, but so that that's the only reference that I've come across in terms of where they were procuring them. But yeah, they are a very limited, we just don't have the extant examples, much like the cap improvers are incredibly rare. Um, and so the ones that are on view in the exhibition are really, really special in terms. But I think too you bring up an interesting point to, just about the satire as well, because there is the making of these ensembles for the men, were they exclusively tailors of this silhouette and of this form, or were, were they diversifying diversified for their form? There were ones, one um, you know, tailor in particular was quite good with the breeches. Another tailor would have been good for the great coats. So they each had their own niche market. And especially, I think, once they were patronized by you know somebody who was celebrated for his path, for his fashion, then then that tailor would then you know that they would become known for that particular cut and style. I noticed uh, that the in some of the earlier drawings, the men have a some sort of thing hanging from mm -hmm. the, the belt area. What, what is that? Is that uh, the jewelry? Or? It is. It's jewelry. Bob. And so there's a fob. So it's a combination. If you would not only have the end of the watch fob, but then there are these beautiful um, comb-like, bejeweled little areas that went off. The, so you see um, in Rommel here, it's coming over and off the top of the fob. So on his right hip. Yeah, so it's again, he's this one simple luxury that he affords himself. He also did have, when there was the estate sale, um, after he had fled to France, there's um, written about a beautiful snuff box that he had received um, from then King George. And so that was a beautifully decorated um, porcelain and Limoges snuff box that he had. Um, but those were the few concessions he had. Is that cloth or is it a, a jewel? I'm sorry? Is it cloth or metal? Or oh, metal? this is metal. Yes, so that's um, gold. Yeah. So from, from the neck up, you, you didn't speak about hats. Or any, and I'm surprised why that wasn't included in, in this discussion, because it seems to be part of this whole look. In there terms of yeah, giving the impression of greater height. In, oh, what, or just yeah. decorum, and I think. Well, yeah. I, th I, I guess we didn't speak about it because we were speaking about a lot already. <laughs> True story. <laughs> um, and uh, and I think because we were, you know, because um, we were, you know, trying to tailor the talk to the exhibition next door, which you know, so it's okay. not as much of the outer so it's kind of the the hat, I suppose. You know, I mean, it's not. It's its own piece of sculpture. It's not, you know, that it's not necessarily conforming to. But it's it's so I think we were really kind of focusing on the body and the and the way that tailoring modifies the body or the the way that the, the tailoring is represented um, in satires. But it's a great I mean yes it's its own subject for sure. <laughs> and I will say um, we are fortunate enough in the uh, Receiving Museum collection to have a really wonderful um, assortment of men's headgear and. Um, Many of them were on view, and so if you do see the um, exhibition catalog, we have many of them illustrated. And in particular, one of my favorites yeah. from when we were working on the show is we have um, a white silk plush top hat, which is incredibly rare. These you just um, can't find them anywhere. Again, and it's it's it's, it's in flare, in but it's, it's it's exaggerated and it's white. Um, and it was we, it was actually found um, in the trunk. Of you know the the attic of a very prominent family in um, in Providence and you know not not was not worn by somebody who was known for his you know excessive style or you know for, um, you know really outre style it was it was um, this was probably just a very well off gentleman but worn when he was young um, so he was able to get away with more which is what we're saying a lot in terms of the the dandies you know this is the Grummel when he was very young. Prince Regent and the, all, all these dandy figures who are quite young and then therefore kind of the fashion models of the day. So, our next 
too many questions. First of all, I want to say that I know this wasn't easy, so congratulations. It's wonderful what you put together. Um, too many questions. Um, is there a look or other animals or brand that you look at it in the States and think, ah, oh, that's dandy? That's one question. And the other mm -hmm. one is, um, when I personally think of tailoring, I think of Sally Hill. Um, but is there some, some consider mistakes? Uh, does it pan out in any way relate to ready to work? Two questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so for the first one, I get, you know, we, we stopped ourselves in about 1970 for this, for this presentation and the exhibition. We, um, you know, we went right up to the present. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we have a lot to say about, you know, the contemporary, um, I think there's, there's a huge surge of interest in terms of, you know, particular, um, you, you know, often very small, you know, local um, tailoring firms um, that are certainly, I would say, you know, now operating on the model of, um, of the dandy. Um, and, you know, again, it's, it also ties into, um, this idea of sustainability in terms of, you know, kind of, of good now, we, you know, going to a tailor, spending a little bit more, but, but buying something that will last for a long, long time, that's made especially for you, that's, that's built to last, right? Um, so, I mean, I, we could name, you know, a, a lot of probably, you know, much, usually much smaller um, firms that kind of rely on um, a knowledgeable clientele. Um, and who are you know focusing on the details? Um, and so there's a you know great great amount of care and attention that you, that, you know is paid on the part of the, the maker and the and the wearer. And there's been you know clearly a connection between the two. Um, and the second part of it. So what was the second part of the question? <laughs> I think we were asking about some little bit um, state size. Like yeah. If there, yeah. how does it relate to sort of fear and maybe even to ready to wear? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think we certainly do have, um, it's interesting that just for the exhibition, and we have been, um, this is what we're joking about museum years, um, this exhibition actually began planning in 2007, um, and it didn't make it on view until 2013, so it's always this evolving process, <laughs> but even at that time in 2007, we had seen really steadily building evidence of an interest in not only um, internationally renowned firms coming more frequently stateside. So you have the Savo Row firms coming and making client visits stateside. So there was a lot more activity in New York City and Boston um, where you have these firms coming in and um, taking orders with clients. But also then even a lot of the Italian firms that um, you, know, you have a very different look coming between Savo Row and Italy. Um, and in Manhattan, there was quite a bit of activity of firms setting up branches or um, shops within shops in bigger um, retail spaces here in the city. But too, just like some of the um, main characters, Merkin, he had a long tradition of working with New York City and Boston tailors and really um, had his vision created by stateside tailors. So very little in his wardrobe um, was actually made on Savo Road. He was really utilizing his own aesthetic um, and often in great conflict with the um, tailors. We have one suit in particular that is a pink um, Czech Harris tweed that the tailor um, advised him strongly against that choice in textile and that was really the start of the show but he was so confident in his own appearance that he really um, embraced it and fought with the tailor on that. But yeah, I would say certainly there is um, a big market here. And then, you know, back to the ready to the wear, I think there's a really interesting, um, the one historian that I mentioned, um, mentioned Michael Zackham, and he teaches at the University of um, Tel Aviv. He really thoroughly looked through all the ready-to-wear industry. And in the United States, it was primarily coming out of um, Philadelphia, New York, and actually upstate New York. Um, there were quite a few ready-to-wear tailoring firms, <coughs> and in particular after the Civil War, um, because many of these firms had to standardize what they were doing in terms of menswear creation for the uniforms. Um, during the Civil War, and then that carried on thereafter. And so you even have that in New York City companies like Brooks Brothers um, also have been active during the Civil War, carrying on that tradition of providing smart, um, but not entirely unique items. 
about menswear. And I think that the you know there's a, the connection to readywear also kind of lies in this um, in you know an increased knowledge and care about materials. So even if something is you know produced in many multiples, you know, with like standard sizes, um, it's really can become about the material and where where it's made. You know, I mean, it is there is a certain um, kind of overall sense to you know kind of knowing where you're where where you're garment was you're made from. and where you're walking from, um, that, you know, that can certainly translate into the ready to wear market. Any other questions? Um, I have two questions. So one is in um, one of the images that you showed of the, the caricatures from the teens, the 18 teen, right? Mm -hmm. um, showed a black dandy in the center of the image. Mm -hmm. Being yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an odd, um, I don't know, question because that same print is is colored sometimes as a black dandy and other times as oh. a white dandy, oh. um, and so it's you know because it's like hand colored. It's a, again it's mass produced, but it's hand colored, so it was kind of the choice of um, you know of the color of the market for you know, for that particular area. So it's um, But does yeah, that occur more than once with that print? Or are you saying in other prints? In other prints of that or and other versions of that same print, that central figure is not colored black. Right. Yeah. Um, but because I'm thinking of um, characters of women from the same period. Mm -hmm. Do not. When when you see a lot also a lot of extreme you know very mm -hmm. extremes in the silhouette mm -hmm. you know in the teens mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I've ever seen that mm -hmm. um, and then there was another was one that you showed where it was one Somebody of the, the one yeah. of the servants was yes. black but not the yes. not the main yeah, but figure. not the main figure I know yeah it's interesting well I think um then Michelle it's interesting because of Monica Miller who we also um, worked with and she's at Barnard. University, and she's um, very much deeply considered the idea of the black dandy. And she did, we went to a lecture of hers, and she was talking about the tradition of your servant, the dressing in your model. Mm -hmm. And so here, mm -hmm. you know, he's attending to the dandy, and yet they've dressed him up in um, the same silhouette and pieces. So I think that's one way that we can look at that print. But yeah, we, we found it highly unusual when we found it, and it was such an interesting print, not only because the central figure has the, the absolute extreme of Patty. He's the most um, you know, characterized of all. But the, then you have this very unusual, um, and it was it was kind of the hunt as we went through different collections to find what tint that person um, mm -hmm. had been mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. so many of my balls of social commentary mm -hmm. and those friends that just, yeah, I could talk all night just about theirs. I don't see that's really. And I just had one, one of the um, graduating MA students did her um, qualifying paper on these two magazines in the interwar period, um, you know, World War I, World War II, one called Monsieur, mm -hmm. and the other one called The um, Younger Seven, mm -hmm. and um, looking at the sort of reemergence of the dandy in the, mm -hmm. the post-World War I period, mm -hmm. and looking back at the historical dandy, and I was just wondering if, mm -hmm. you know, that came into some of your research? For your exhibition and sort of um, the the, the reemergence of the dandy in the post-war period and how he may or may not have been different or um, perceived differently or perceived himself differently um, mm -hmm. after that watershed moment of World War One. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. We didn't we didn't have too many. Um, yeah. We had one. Well, we had um, the White House collection. Yeah. So we had, um, it was um, Senator White House's um, family that are in Newport, Rhode Island. We actually had his entire um, wardrobe, pretty much, of both military attire, plus then um, the White House family had lots of connections with England, so we had um, items of clothing that were made by Poole and Company and things like that. And so we really focused. He was kind of our case study. Um, and we ended up, I mean, I, I will concede, I think, 
we did add scientific caricatures. We had quite a bit of emphasis. Um, we were very much Anglophiles in the exhibition that we did, so we didn't have as much of the French, which is really wonderful in this exhibition that it's kind of um, fulfilling it's really that role. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so we did, we used a lot of our Newport families because we also had um, a few dandies. We had one other gentleman that just had such a cache of um, shirts that you, know, you could just imagine um, seeing you know, where Robert Redford is going through the wardrobe in um, um, I think Great Great Gatsby. Gatsby. In Great Great Gatsby, exactly. And so um, we had those um, post war men um, in our discussion, but not as much regretfully. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, I think. Um, I mean, because there is that connection as it was, um, you know, for, for both Rommel, that connection between, you know, dr military dress, you know, so mm -hmm. having to be fitted mm -hmm. by a, a tailor, mm -hmm. um, and then kind of in getting used to that in a way, or getting used to that way of kind of being buttoned up and that the formality, um, and getting to getting a knowledge of, you know, good construction. I mean, so there, yeah, that, I mean, we, we, we didn't touch upon it very much, I mean, because the, the, what we had from that period in the exhibition um, was from this um, fellow White House's um, gar wardrobe. And um, it, what's interesting is that he, he led, you know, just post-college, he was, you know, part of the kind of bank role an expedition, a map making expedition to like, find the you know, lands you know, south of Abyssinia. To, um, yeah, so he was traveling, in other words, and then he ended up in India. And we have some, like, a beautiful, um, beautiful sunline suit, um, really just the most amazing you know, material that was made in India, you know, with the label that he wore and obviously saved, you know, it dates right, you know, right then, you know, mm -hmm. right post-war. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, that's interesting to think of, you know, yeah, that, that like, a connection to kind of military and utilitarian, you know, in terms of, like, being on, you know, expedition, um, and then, you know, finding one's interest, you know, in, in kind of the, the tailoring and in material. Um, but, yeah. That, yeah, that we didn't, yeah. It's a good subject to have a dissertation on. <laughs> <laughs> Any further questions? Well, I'll close with one question. I think we'd be remiss to talk about the dandy or you know, inquire about the dandy with you without talking about literature, which is clearly such a huge part of this project. Um, and I wonder if you could speak about having to dive into all of this 19th century literature and what that experience is like. Um, but also, it was interesting to think about, kind of culturally, nationally, how the literature was a little bit different as you looked at the extreme satire in Britain versus in France, you had kind of more straight literature. And then I guess I'm just wondering if there was a response in Britain to the satire, if there was any sort of kind of dandies kind of writing in response to this criticism, or they were just skulking away. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, I didn't, we didn't I didn't find any much of a response. Um, I mean, uh, it's, you know, it's obviously there's the 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 literary the, the criticism um, and uh, you know the, the satiric portraits are you know very like strong. You know, I mean they're very heavy handed. Um, but that's, yeah, that's an interesting question. But I you know I don't I don't recall there being really much of a response. I mean, I, I wonder if, if that's in part because of um, kind of just how ridiculous, like what, what response could one have, you know? I mean, you're, like, you're there, yes, you are focused on fashion, you're young, you know, some of them had to be, and some of them, you know, made it there, you know, they're, 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 they just made it their life too, or what, you know, to buy some of these pieces, um, and that, I mean, and that was their performance, like that was their answer mm -hmm. in a way. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, but it, but I mean, yes, reading the, the literature and the, um, just the, you know, kind of the, the periodical, like daily um, <laughs> yeah, um, commentary, you know, especially in Fraser's magazine is just, um, yeah, yeah, very, very amusing, you know, that these, that it's, 
interesting that these writers did spend so much of their time fixating on clothing that they were criticizing, but that they were completely fixated. You know? Yeah, very interesting. It's fascinating. Um, well, please all join me in thanking Kate and Lauren.